So I'm Kate Betts, a member of the board here, and it's my honor to introduce this man. We have a shared history. In the 70s, I worked for Charles Butt, who owns the Lighthouse, and helped research and edit a book on the Lighthouse, privately printed, and some of that information are on posters up here. And Rick is the old, the longest standing Lighthouse keeper. <laughs> He beat, <laughs> he beat Stevenson by, what, a year? And he's the only lighthouse keeper that I interviewed some of them, did oral history. He's the only one who plays bagpipes as his wife is lighting the story. He came to Port Aransas to be a lighthouse keeper uh, after successful establishment of uh, the Fort Worth Nature Center and the Armand Bayou Nature Center in Houston. While he was director of the Port Aransas uh, Museum, he created it. He acquired and moved and restored the historic life-saving service station. That little museum, if you haven't been over there, is just marvelous. You need to go. Uh, it's had many wonderful exhibits, not just about traditional museum subjects, but things like surfing, you know, to pull in a different population. He created an archive of more than 20,000 historical photographs and documents provided local history education to area students. They host a very popular winter lecture series that's fascinating. And he's published two books of historic significance, The Mercer Logs, Pioneer Times on Mustang Island, which we have a copy over there that's really interesting, and Hard Heads and Half Gales, Tales from Tarpon. He also purchased, restored, and reestablished the historic Farley Boat Works, which has built well over 50 Boats. Well, I was, you need to update your information on your website. <laughs> and he's teaching and bringing back traditional port a, uh, boat building skills, including the small rowing and sailing skiffs so common when it was called Tarpon, Texas, to new generations of family. He's also started a maritime museum there that's just wonderful. I can't get my husband Tom out of it. Has whole outboard motors and they're building a big ship, and, but you have to go over there. He's also been a civic activist serving on city council, fishing, achieving official recognition for the preservation of the Old Town District and hosting the annual Old Town Festival, Port A Wooden Boat Festival, and the Farley Classic Golf Tournament. Tournament. He and his wife are ardent conservationists because she started out life as a biologist. He may look like a pirate, and he kind of is. <laughs> I, when I had some tough dilemmas being on the history board of uh, saving <laughs> old buildings or something, I think, what would Rick do? And it all becomes clear, but it also has gotten me a lot of trouble. <laughs> Um, he's a passionate guardian of our island's traditions and heritage, a generous and collaborative colleague, and a spinner of terrific yarns, most of them true. I think you're very proud. All right. She told a few stretchers. Well, first off, howdy. Howdy. How are y'all? Good. Good. Any veterans in the crowd? Yes. <laughs> Let's give him a hand. Yeah. Stretcher number one, that I am the longest, that I have the longest tenure of keep as keeper at the Aransas Fast Light Station. That isn't true. We have. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do something like that alone. The history of the place pointed out the fact that people went nuts out there when they were there alone. <laughs> Some of them started nuts, yeah, but you know, it, was, it, was it was difficult. So we squared off with it together and we set the record, there's no doubt about that. Second, the archive that we have at the Porter Ancestors Museum is remarkable and it's available. Some of it online but we don't have the bandwidth, so you have to come over. You can get most any historic photo or document from there on a jump drive if you just come visit the museum. We can't get them all on one computer at once because it's no longer 20,000, it's 36,000. And the person who put that together is Mark Creighton. You know him? Yeah. I'm not a bit surprised, okay? Mark is a remarkable guy. And once upon a time, 
we had a collection of photographs in the library. They were all photographs, black and whites and whatever, in a box. That was the curation. Then the pipes in the ceiling froze, opened, rained down the library, destroyed the books and the photos. At that point, Mark decided we've got to do something better to save our history. And compulsive doesn't begin to describe it. So please take advantage of all those lovely, lovely. Since he's through with you, would you like to volunteer over here? So, <laughs> Since he's through with y'all, would you like to volunteer over here? Well, uh, you know, actually, we there's a chip in his leg, and he's not allowed over here. <laughs> all right. We had a wonderful time restoring the lighthouse. We had a terrible time restoring the lighthouse. And that will become clear in a moment. I wrote a lot of essays about life out there and restoration and etc. And it really focused me on history of the area. Because every time I looked at something, I saw an old, old structure that had been repaired many, many, many times. And as I would go back through it to repair it another time, there would be one layer of excellent work. Whoever did that was really top. And then I go into the next layer, and oh my lord, <laughs> this person just, you know, why did they do that? And the next layer, and so on. And it became clear very quickly that you don't want to be down in history as a guy who let the most iconic historic structure in the region go to heck. It really drives you. There is a feeling of duty that quickly grabs you when you go to a place like that. And there were a lot of, a lot of advantages to living there. And we'll get into that. Now, some of these essays I wrote a long time ago. A few of you seem like you might be as old as me. <laughs> I'm an older. You will have discovered that memory is no longer your strong suit, <laughs> as have I. So I'm going to partially read these, and then I'll try to just recite them, because there's nothing worse, more boring than hearing somebody read stuff. And as I go, these pictures are, can you start there? It's been sitting on that one for a long time. These pictures will just play behind me. They're a mix of ages and stages in the restoration or the management of the lighthouse. Some of them are quite old, some of them are relatively new. Now before we start, have you been to the lighthouse? Ah, it's rare to see this many people that have been there. Did Kay Betts have something to do with it? No. Yeah. 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 So, uh, no. yeah. History. What is history? History is anything that happened before yesterday. <laughs> all right, so it, that's a mighty big subject, but all of us sort of focus in on something, right? Now, this is my grandmother's take on wit and wisdom. My grandmother lived to be 101 years old, 101 and a half. Now, it's kind of funny, but when you're little children, you count age in months, right? Year and a half, 18 months, whatever, 16, 17 months. And then when you become an adult, you count it in decades. <laughs> I'm 50-ish, I'm 40-ish, I'm 30-ish, whatever. Then when you become really old, if we should all be so lucky, you go back, you revert, and you began to count in months again. We were so proud of the fact that Grandma made it to 101 and a half years old. So if we carry that out, my grandmother lived to be 1,206 months old. <laughs> That's a mighty long time to live. And she had a saying about everything, and she is the lady who taught me to love history. She came to live with us when she was in, I thought she was quite ancient. She probably was in her 60s, maybe her late 50s. Yeah, I know, it's funny now. But, you know, she was the oldest person in my family. And she told stories all the time of her life in Appalachia. It's not Appalachia. It's like throwing Appalachia. Okay? She was the wife of a minister, a preacher man, who was apparently not totally accepted by the, the uh, conference, and they gave him tiny little churches on the back side of back mountains in Appalachia, Virginia and West Virginia. It was a tough life. She had come from the first family 
of Virginia. She really had a long historical standing before she was born. Her family was an important family. And then she marries a preacher. Now, they don't pay him much. And they expect a lot out of him. And she traveled with this man to every tiny little place you can imagine. My mother was born in Paint Bank, Virginia. You've heard of that, of course. <laughs> and that's what I thought. My grandmother was born in Grassy Lick, Virginia. You've heard of that too? <laughs> well, we went and we lifted them up, and one of them still exists, and the other is no longer even a memory. But she told me stories that brought that era to life, and she was good at it. She told me about the neighbors who, when the police came to town, would put all the illegal booze in their aprons and run down the street and hide it in the barn. <laughs> it was incredible. She taught me about a, a dog they had, a hound, bred up of many hounds, but, but no particular breed. That was the best bear hound in the county. And as people were going out bear hunting, they'd come by and they'd check the dog out and take him with them. Take him with them. His name was Barney. <laughs> Barney was alive to me. I never saw a picture of him. But he still was alive. So this lady brought history into, into my heart. She made it fun, and she made it important. So I tried very hard to become a biologist. But there's probably no worse way to make a living than as a historian. Because people don't care. I mean, they do care, but they don't care enough. You know, you're just not going to have a successful career. So let's do something like biology. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, you know, starting salaries were huge, like 18000 a year. So, okay, I made a, an early mistake. And I realized it. And I went back into history. We came to Fort Aransas, Texas, to start building traditional boats. Another grand commercial idea. <laughs> we opened a little tiny boat shop. And people begin to come in and tell me stories about the Farleys. And that started my interest in the history of this area, this particular area. Later, I was visited by a man, came to my boat shop. I'm too busy to talk to him. People come into a boat shop and they want to chat. They don't want to help you build. They don't really care what kind of boat you're building as long as it's a boat. They just want to talk. And that's great, you get a lot of good stories, but you know you don't get a damn thing done. And so I put a chair over on one side, a chair on the other, and this side had a sign over it, work area, and this side, side had a sign over it, BS area. <laughs> they didn't all take the hint. But this fellow walked in and he said, uh, I've got a guy who wants to offer you a job. I said, I've got a job, and it's right here, and I've got to get it finished, and I'm two days late now, but you know, tell me while I work. He said, well, he would like you to fix his house. So well, we don't do that. We do boats. We don't fix houses. Thanks anyway. And he came back and he said, you really need to talk to this guy. You really do. It could be a mistake not to. And I thought, man, this guy's threatening me. And he's pushing it. I said, okay, okay. What's he do? He said, well, he works for a grocery store. <laughs> See, that's really what I want to do is uh, go res repair the summer home of a guy who sacks groceries. Thanks, but no thanks. And he came back the third time, and I said, third time's the charm. we got to go meet this guy, whoever he is. He was Charles Butt. <laughs> and he did work for a grocery store. <laughs> he happened to own it also. So that is how we met. Now, I am always on time or early. It is an affliction almost. He is always late. Our first meeting went that way. I walk into the office in Corpus Christi, which was hard to find based on poor instructions. I got there on time a little bit early. I sit down and I've got my briefcase and I've got my, I put on a, uh, the closest I have to a suit, which is a blazer. And I'm sitting and I'm reading boring magazines waiting for this guy who was late. I'm on khakis. I'm on loafers. He walks in finally. He's got a briefcase just like mine. He's wearing a blue blazer, a white shirt, and khakis, and he's wearing the same kind of shoes I'm wearing. 
And I thought, is this guy trying to set me up? <laughs> we began our conversations, and in short order, he, he hooked us in. Now, I made up my mind. This man is immensely wealthy, and he owns this incredible, iconic, historic place out in the swamp where I'd love to live for a little while. But <clears throat> I'm going to hit him with a huge, huge salary request. Enough of this being a biologist. Enough of this being a boat builder. We're going to get rich. <laughs> so it came to that point in the negotiations, and I slapped out my salary demand on the table, and he went, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And we started our lives at the lighthouse. Now, <clears throat> I want to tell you one little poem that my grandmother taught me. It was about wit about intelligence. She said, big head, little wit. Little head, not a bit. <laughs> My half size is seven and one eighth, so don't expect much. <laughs> before the lighthouse, I mean the lighthouse is all that anybody thinks about, but before the lighthouse there was a pass, a Ramses pass. It separates one island from another. We do not have the slightest idea what their real names were because nobody bothered to talk to the Karankala or the Colville Taker. We don't know what their names were, but we know what they are now. And you left us out when you did this exhibit on the Barrier Islands. What happened to Mustang? It's not you didn't include it. It's not all right, so I feel a little left out, all right? <laughs> Mustang Island was there and a pass cut it off from what is now St. Joseph's Island, or now San Jose. And without that pass, nothing would have happened. None of these little towns would have developed. You had to have a pass. What is a pass? Just a hole through an island where the ocean can get out. But it's immensely important. And so, because of that pass, we built a lighthouse. The folks in Washington who know everything, as you well know, decided we needed a lighthouse. There were some movers and shakers in this area that also decided we needed a lighthouse. Some of them were from Rockport. Some were from Corpus Christi. Some were actually Mercers who lived on Mustang Island and were the settlers, first settlers of Port Aransas. So this group got together. They were movers and shakers. So they wanted a lighthouse because they wanted to bring commerce to this area. They wanted to open it up. They wanted to make progress. So the government sent a team down and they were to choose a spot where the lighthouse should be built. Seems easy enough, right? All this land is for sale, by the way. I mean, you can actually just claim it if you want it. So cost isn't a real issue. It's just location, location, location. Well, this group of four people, five according to some reports, <coughs> could not quite agree. There was one person in the crowd, at least, who said, this is stupid, don't do it. If you build a lighthouse here, you're going to discover that that pass is moving. And it's going to get left behind. You're going to waste all your money. So instead, put up a light ship. You know what those are? It's a boat, a ship, with right at the top of the mast, a lens and a light. And then when the pass shifts, you bring up the anchor and you move the boat and then you drop the anchor again. There you go. Everything's cool. Everything's fine. But there was a brick merchant who was in the crowd. Uh -huh. And a developer. And guess what? We got a lighthouse. They started the process in 1853. And by 1857, this was remarkable, four years from beginning to look at it to finishing it, they pulled the string and lit up the light, and we were in business, 1857. <clears throat> That's not much, not too long after first settlers actually got here. So we got on the, on the map pretty quick. Well, almost immediately. A letter goes off. Washington, we've got a problem. The pass is shifting. <laughs> it's moving. I mean, you can see it move 200 feet a year. And you, you can figure that down into days if you wish, but 200 feet a year, you're going to notice it. And not only was it changing, but 
The shoals inside it were shifting, so it was difficult to get through. You had to have a pilot come out and get on your boat and get you through. Even though the lighthouse was there, we were a long way from done. A long way from done. So it was decided we should build a jetty. And you know what a jetty is. Okay. The first people to rise to that challenge were businessmen in Rockport, Texas. <laughs> They raised 10,000 bucks. This is 1855, 58, somewhere in there. 10,000 bucks was a lot of money. And they raised that because Rockport was the port. This was going to make you guys rich. This was going to secure your future. So they hired somebody, we can't find out who or I haven't anyway, <clears throat> and he somewhere found some rocks and he stacked them up on the downslope side of the channel, and it just rolled right over it. Yeah. <laughs> Within two years, there was not a trace of it. The Corps of Engineers came and said, what jetty? <laughs> so the pass kept moving. It took five tries and 50 years to catch the pass, and it's quite an adventure. I don't have time to go into all of it. It included a private-public partnership, which was rare for the day. It's rare for today, although it's getting more common. And this one group hired a guy who was an engineer and a professor. Uh, interesting combination, you know. So this professor said, if you build an S-shaped jetty, which he called a reaction breakwater, you only have to build one. It will dredge itself and keep itself open. You'll never have to worry about it. You can determine the depth of the channel by how long the jetty is. And they bought it. This man's name was Haupt, H-A-U-P-T. Kind of hard to say. <clears throat> he had good credentials. He had helped design the Panama Canal. That's a pretty good card to play it right up on top, right? And he had published an awful lot of stuff. So this group, the Aransas Harbor Company, hired him to design the jetty. He designed it. They raised the money, and they got started. One of, the ways that, one of the ways they raise the money is, you've been to the lighthouse, right? You've seen the swamp between Port A and the lighthouse? That was going to be a city by the sea. <laughs> they were going to have four-story houses and four-lane roads, and oh, um, what a place this was going to be. What a place. And they sold lots. And they sold them nationally through newspapers and things. And they sold a lot of them. They raised a lot of money. That never happened, but you know, we, I'm sure there were some angry people for a while, but they're all dead and forgotten. <laughs> Real estate people were dishonest back then. They're not today, are they? No. I didn't think so. Okay. So, anyway, they raised some money and they began building the jetties, and immediately the U.S. Army Corps came in to blow them out of water. It was called the Army Engineers at the time, and they did not want any private company getting in their face, taking their business. They went to Congress, and they raised hell about it. Let's get these people out of here. They're incompetent. They published papers against them. They threatened contractors. If you go to work for these guys, you will never, ever get a government grant again. Pretty forceful stuff. Eventually, they ran them broke. Now, it's quite possible that the Hopped Group, the Harbor Company, helped because they spent quite a bit of money on food for all. But nonetheless, this project was almost finished when the Corps finally ran them broke and stopped them. <clears throat> Wheeler, for whom a street is named in Aransas Pass, they ought to call it Wheeler Pass. I mean, this guy was something. He was really something. I think they named the library for him, too, didn't they? Anyway, Mr. Wheeler went to, up to Congress and he said, look, we're almost finished. Give us another year and a little bit more money and we'll be done. And the Corps intervened again and they said, no, nope, sorry. So the Corps took over the project and at that point it moved forward in a hurry. But there was one interesting little thing they did first. This S-curve jetty was starting to work. It wasn't quite long enough, but it was dredging itself. It was performing. They said, we can't have that. So they connected it to the shore. And I have a photo called Filling the Gap. Now this jetty was supposed to stand by itself. It wasn't supposed to touch the land, but, but it did. Finally, because the Corps 
made it touch the land. Then they went over and finished the other jetty, and there we go. We're done. The jetty is finished. The pass is now open, and we begin to bring ships in, and you know the rest, as they say, is history. But what of the lighthouse? It is now almost two miles, 1.6 miles away from the pass. So it's almost obsolete to begin with. Therefore, not a very important place to be. And so, guess what? The people who got assigned as keepers were largely second and third catch. You know? But it must have been a wonderful place to be. Because you don't really have a whole lot of duty. You're in a beautiful spot. Right next door is a town. You can get there on a boat. Couldn't have been too bad. Couldn't have been too bad at all. Now, let's condense the history from here. Everybody knows what happened in the 1860s. Yeah. We're refighting that war, did you notice? The nation is refighting that war. We're tearing down statues. We're making a big ruckus about it, too. So we haven't settled it out yet. But <clears throat> that which has happened cannot be changed. The Yanks came down here, and they brought a gunship. And the man who ran it was named Kittredge. He, who, by the way, ended up getting court-martialed and drummed out of the service. He apparently wasn't a real good guy. But he brought a gunship down here, and he took over the pass, and they took over the lighthouse. Now, there were some Confederates up in uh, San Antonio, and one of them was named um, Hobby. You ever heard of the Houston newspaper? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Hobby family. Well, this was Marmaduke Hobby, great-grandfather of... Bill Hobby, who was the uh, lieutenant. lieutenant governor of Texas. And Hobby says to his captain, take three kegs of black powder and go down and take out that lighthouse. Now, <clears throat> those of you who've served know that's not the kind, that's not the kind of project you want. You've got to come down here in enemy territory, basically, being watched by a big gunship and somehow disabled that lighthouse. So they crawled up into the tower, got there by small boat, rigged it, blew it up, and got away. They were good. They were really good. They were what we would call an elite force. Now the lighthouse is it's dark. It's silent. There is a rumor that they took the lens out and buried it in the swamp. And people are still looking for it. <laughs> I should have made maps. And sold them, you know. And this is a big fundraising opportunity, there, but I don't think it happened. When you set off several kegs of black powder in a lantern room, which contains it, there's nothing left of that lens. <clears throat> and then they left, and they got away. And it is reported that the Yankee gunboat sent a launch after them with a gun on the foredeck, and the guys couldn't shoot well enough to get them. <laughs> and they were sailing a Texas boat, which is very shallow draft, and they just took off across the flats, and the gunboat couldn't follow them. So they probably, when these guys got back, the gunboat crew got back, I'm sure that they were given a severe talking to by Captain Kittredge, but that ended it. The lighthouse was now dark, and it stayed dark until 1868. It took a long time to get that next lens and put it in there and rebuild the tower. The first day that my wife and I walked on the station, the damage was still obvious. The cracks that run up the light tower were a result of that explosion. It blew it up good. And finally it was put back together. Now, we'll fast forward a little bit more. <clears throat> finally, the United States Congress, in its wisdom, decided that all the lighthouse service should be taken over by the Coast Guard, the United States Coast Guard. Good people, the Coasties, but they didn't know a lot about lighthouses. So all of a sudden, they inherited all the lighthouses in America, and that began the downward slide of lighthouses, and it still continues. Well, this station was transferred in 1940, and the Coast Guard took it over. And when they took it over, there wasn't nearly enough facility out there to keep all their people. And so they expanded it, and they built another building, and then another building. They ended up building one and a half buildings and a shop, so it changed it. It was a major change in history. And that's 1940. By 1956, you know what happened? 
the light went out for good. It was declared to be redundant for two reasons. One, where was it? You know, almost 10 miles from the pass. What good is it? Second, it took an awful lot of effort and money to keep it up. And so the Coast Guard said, we're closing it, and they did. At that point, they took the lens out and took it into Port Aransas and stored it at their place and shut the door and tried to sell the place. They wanted $2,600 for it. <laughs> and there was no buyer. They offered it to the University of Texas Marine Science Institute for free. Wow. They wouldn't take it. But they did say, we will take that main house if you'll allow us to cut it loose and move it. How in the hell they thought they were going to do that, I don't know. So the White House stayed. There it was. Finally, they got a buyer. Private individual bought it. It became a hunting fishing camp and a place where many wild parties were thrown. And then one of those guys who was a contractor, and I know this is hard to believe, but not all contractors are honest. And he was busted and went to jail, and his partner sold out, and it went to the next group. They loved the place. They restored it inside, which means they brought it up to the standards of interior decoration at the time, with all kinds of splintery cedar inside it on the walls. Took down the floor to ceiling, tongue and groove, beaded fur boards that had been there since the beginning, and replaced it. So they loved it. They loved it. Their name was Frost, nothing to do with the bank. Later, Mr. Frost contracted cancer, and he spent many of his last days at the lighthouse. After he died, uh, his wife, his widow, was just heartbroken and couldn't bear to let go of the place. Could not bear to let it go. And so it fell into ruin. Again, it's been through a lot of these, you know, dynamite explosions in the tower and then years and years of disuse. Finally, it fell into ruin again. Then, <clears throat> a game changer came through. We had a lot of those here. We didn't have one for 43 years, and we thought we were in there, didn't we? But Celia came through and left a footprint, big footprint, on the lighthouse. Really hurt it. Really hurt it. At this point, Mrs. Frost realized she could not bring it back to life. It wasn't going to happen. It just simply could not happen. And she decided she would sell it. Well, for the last two years, this young fella whose daddy owned a grocery store had been sailing his sailboat up and down Lydia Ann Channel and looking at that lighthouse and said, I would love to have that. I would like for this to be mine. And he had contacted Mrs. Ross and she said, no, no way. After the hurricane hit it, I'm not supposed to say that, I'm sorry. H word, we never say the H word. <laughs> After the storm hit it, he contacted Mrs. Frost and she said yes, she would. Now here's the story that Charles told me, that Mr. Buck told me. He said he had a price in mind, kind of like me. He had a price in mind. He went over. The door is opened by the servant. There's a long, long, long hall leading to a throne where Mrs. Frost is sitting in repose. And he said he walked forward and genuflected and made his offer. And she laughed. He ended up buying it, but for a whole lot more money than he wanted to put into it. And the insurance people were kind enough, and he began to rebuild it. But it didn't work so well. It kept the people that he was bringing out there weren't quite up to the job or didn't really have the skills, who knows. But eventually, <clears throat> he saw us coming about two miles away. And we were roped into coming out and once again restoring the lighthouse. It was probably the best move we ever made. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the first thing we learned, the very first thing we learned after getting out there, is that everything comes by a boat. <laughs> everything comes by boat. Now that is a limiting factor that you may not think much of. I mean, so what? Boats are fun, right? You got one. How many of you have a boat? 
Mm -hmm. Not as smart as I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> and they sit in your garage, right? Mm -hmm. And you pile stuff in them, and you know, the engine ran last time. Well, why didn't it start this time? So we had to have a boat, and it had to run. And when we showed up, the man who had been there before us was not much of a boat keeper, so we had one boat left, and it had no reverse. <laughs> Not a really easy beginning, but we, we got all that sorted out. So we figured it out that everything comes by boat. Now this is a limiting factor that you're never probably going to experience, and that's great. So took it, take it from me, it is a limiting factor. <clears throat> I hold some really strange stuff, even if you don't count the people. <laughs> Every stick of lumber used in the rebuild and repair of the station was unloaded from a truck, loaded on a boat, taken to the lighthouse, unloaded from the boat, and carried to the job site. Now think about that. When you're talking 20 foot 2 by 12s, that's a pretty weighty proposition. And then all the scrap has to be hauled off because you can't leave it out there. You know, I mean, it's a salt marsh. It's a natural area, you just can't do that. So it would be nails, groceries, Christmas presents, babies, old folks, dogs, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, and all their gear. Enough furniture to fill three houses at least three times. Refrigerators, air conditioners, cords and cords of wood. And man, that was a challenge. Valuable art, hundreds of pounds of mail, tanks full of water, tanks full of diesel for the generator, the generator itself, tons of household supplies, and a host of other things, big and small. Including, finally, an antique lighthouse lens, all shared the tiny deck of our 20-foot whaler. 20 foot. If you don't know how long it is, pace it off. We had to get everything on a 20-foot boat. Wow. Now, loading a boat properly is a necessary skill, and it's one you best pay attention to, but it's one that most people do not. After a while, though, of running a boat, you begin to think in terms of weight and CG, just like you're flying an airplane. Getting it right is important and makes a huge difference in the way the boat handles. So a small boat which is loaded too heavy in the front, and most of them are, if you don't believe that, go to boat launch and watch how people all crowd up to the front of the boat. And, <coughs> and that might be okay in the summer with pot-bellied fishermen on board, but you shouldn't do that with rich ladies in the winter. <laughs> You want them to stay dry. But if you level the load, in the whole, then the whole experience is way more pleasant and easy. Marks the difference in an amateur wheel turner in a real boat. And it's so important. I've got one unfortunate incident comes to mind. <clears throat> we had an assistant keeper. We had to because we weren't ever going to get any time off if we didn't. And he had to know how to operate everything and be there for us. So we just take a couple of days off a month and go somewhere just to get away. <clears throat> this guy was a nice fellow, but not exactly a terribly experienced boatman. Uh, and he was a little resistant to training, but I figured he had it down. The Garden Club in Port Aransas, probably the single most important organization on Mustang Island the island you left out of your exhibit, was going to come out and visit the lighthouse. That's important. That's darn important. But a friend's mother had just died, and we needed to go up and be with him in Galveston, Texas. And we left, and we left our assistant in charge. And that sets up the thing. <clears throat> he showed up at the dock, and began to load these people, some of them fairly large, onto the 20-foot whaler. And he's too shy to ask them what their weight is. That's a trick you have to learn. And he's also too shy to ask them, please come back here, don't sit up there. So they all go forward so they can watch the dolphins and the boat. Goes. <coughs> and go back to this. Strike one. So he pushes off from the dock. He decides he'll take them in two loads instead of three. That's strike one. Pushes off from the dock, starts heading out. The boat is so far down by the nose that fuel can't get to the antenna. <laughs> and he runs out of fuel. Right in the middle of Port A Harbor. Thank goodness, right between the two jetties. And now all of a sudden, all these ladies are shouting advice at him. 
And they are not pleased. They are not pleased at all because after all, these are the garden club ladies. They are not quite royalty, but darn close. <laughs> there is, you know, drifting and floating and just embarrassed as all. Get out. And somebody comes in, throws him a line, drags him back up to the dock. He doesn't tie the boat securely. He goes to get out. He unloads the ladies. Apparently they get out. Everything's okay. He goes to step out of the boat. The boat separates from the dock. Oh, no. Now he's totally demoralized. So he swims out to the boat. He swings over the side and he leaves. And that leaves the garden club sitting at the dock. We and they heard a lot about that when we finally return. All right. <clears throat> it's a terrible story, but it is true. And a lot of, you know, a lot of true stories are not very interesting. Most of the ones at the lighthouse were extremely interesting. And, hmm, what do we got? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we first moved to the lighthouse, people would ask us how far away it was, and I don't know why. But I guess they'd been looking at it for so long, they wanted to know how far from town it was. <clears throat> Took us a while to figure it out, and here's why. How far is it when there's a northern line, and you're the only boat on the water, and it's nighttime, it's real cold. It's too far to go get a newspaper. It's too far to go get a gallon of milk. How far is it when you get to the dock and you forgot your car keys? A long way back. With discussion to match. So when everything comes by boat like that, there you go. How, how far is it when you have one power line that comes across four miles of salt marsh. And it's always sizzling. You know, we learn very quickly that rust never sleeps. You can close your eyes and hear it. <laughs> always fighting it. Always fighting it. So how far is it? How far is it to town when you have a phone every now and then, but not very often, because the phone line runs through the marsh too, and it's real hard to find leaks in it. How far is it when you've got to walk out to the middle of the marsh in the winter to find a break in the line so that you can finally coax the lineman into coming and fixing it? How far is it when you depend on cisterns for your water? You know what cisterns are? Yes. yes. Big barrels. That's all they are. And they're fed by gutters. So if you don't keep up the gutters and you don't keep up the big barrels and you don't have any water, and that's the situation when we first got there. We'd have a good rain, and then we'd all run out because the barrels leaked. So we figured, you know, the first thing we had to do was maybe patch those barrels. How far is it to town when you're the only people, and you're on a small island, and your nearest neighbors are coyotes and great blue herons? So after much consideration, we decided that we were two miles and 50 years from town. <laughs> And we were. <coughs> was out in the marsh. I was out in the marsh a lot. You know, you, you get used to it. <coughs> Finally, it just seems normal. What kind of shoes do you wear in the marsh? What kind of clothes do you wear in the marsh? How do you carry your tools? It takes a lot of learning, but finally you get the point. So I was out in the marsh a lot. Because, well, it's power poles. And they're big, they're tall. 30-foot <coughs> poles with a big mat, cross mast on them. But I discovered early on that there were some five-foot poles out there, five-foot electrical poles. And every darn one of them was marked with a copper tag nailed on there. United States Coast Guard number so-and-so. Height of bureaucracy. Just the height of bureaucracy. Or <clears throat> maybe they're just trying to keep people from pilfering all these things that were valuable. So here was this, this whole line of poles out through the marsh that were five feet tall. And they had had electricity on because when the electricity first came to the lighthouse it came on those lines. I thought, man, that's different. Think of the philosophy that allowed that to happen. You could not do that today because as you know you're responsible for everybody's well-being 
anywhere in the world at any given moment. You cannot certainly put a five foot pole there because some idiot would walk up and grab it. Now back then, the philosophy they had exhibited by this beautiful little copper tag was that if you're dumb enough to grab a high voltage line, <laughs> then you probably ought to be taken out of the breeding population. <laughs> it's the Darwin Award thing. God, would it have been easier if we had had five foot power poles instead of 30 foot. Now, <clears throat> here's a story called Home Court Advantage. We had a break in the line, and it took, since it's high voltage, it took some expert people to come out and fix it. First, we had to cut the power off on the main line, or actually on the causeway that leads between Port Aransas and Aransas Pass. We had to get that shut off. Then we had to march out into the swamp with ladders and wire and tools and all this stuff and fix it. The guys from the power company or from the uh, lineman's company showed up. We got in the boat and I took them out and they thought, this is great, man, this is fun. And then we pull up onto the bank of the swamp and we get out and we get our waders on and off we go. And we're carrying two section, a ladder in two sections. This is, you know, one of those that stretches out and hooks on. <clears throat> so I'm carrying one section, this guy's carrying another. We each have two buckets full of tools <clears throat> and a big coil of wire. And we head out. It's right in about the center, not quite, but almost the center naturally. So we're about halfway out there, and this one guy is heaving so bad that he's got to stop. So we stop, take a break, and we start again, and he's, he can't handle it. So I pick up his bucket, and I start carrying his bucket. I got the ladder over here, and I've got two buckets. So we get almost to the site, and finally, the other guy says, I can't go any further. I've got to rest. So we rest. And we get to the place, and we put the ladder back together and put it up. And they make the repair, and they're good at that. They are good at that. And then we come back down, and we're going to head back this mile and a quarter across the salt marsh back to where the boat is. Well, they're up there making the repair, and he discovers... The one pair of pliers that he needs, worse than any, is still in the boat. Okay, so I walk back and get the tool and then walk back and up it goes and they, they, make, they finally finish the repair. Okay, now we start back up. Within about 50 yards, I had both ladders again. Within about 75 or 100 yards, I had both buckets again. And the first thing those guys did when they got to the ground was light up a cigarette. <laughs> now, I was 54 years old, and they were in their 20s. And by the time we got back to where the boat was, they could barely throw their leg over the side. And I thought, God, these guys are wimps. But actually, it was just home court advantage. How many of you are used to walking through mangrove swamp? <laughs> how do you know how to avoid the creek that's got this much quicksand in it and go to the one that's still hard and flowing? You know, it takes a while. So it was a home court advantage. This place had become our home. We had become accustomed to it. It had taught us the lessons we needed to know to survive out there. And these poor guys, well, they didn't ever come back. <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't ever come back. This next little essay is burned into my brain, and it's called Jed Brundret and the <laughs> Island Way. Yeah. We got a brother right here in town, right here in the crowd. He left. He, no, he must have known it was coming. I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> Jed Brundrett is an island guy. He's quite remarkable. In fact, he's unique. If any of you have met him, you will have to agree. The first thing you learn about Jed Brundrett is he speaks a different language. He speaks Old Island, and it takes a while to get into that rhythm and to understand what this guy is trying to tell you. But once you get it down, he's got a lot of good info. He also is always barefoot and in shorts, and it does not matter what the weather, what the day, what the hell's going on. He's barefoot and in shorts. And he drives a boat, it's called the Josie boat. And this thing is barely held together. I mean, the first time you see it, you say, that's bound to sink. And probably in the next 30 to 45 minutes. But no, it never does. And old Jed is such a boat man that he can drive in and out of hell and not get singed. He is good 
He's bad too. He's just walking the point in Vietnam, so there's nothing wrong with his bravery. And he's a very competent guy. Cameron and I are on the side porch at the lighthouse in our wonderful little home that we have restored. Oops. And we're looking out and we see a little tornado come through. Is that funny? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> a little whirlwind, a tornado kind of tornado cloud, and it snaps off a power pole right in the middle of the marsh. And the pole, this was something to watch. The pole goes around like this. Boom! Oh, yeah. And it falls down. And the lights go out. The stove goes out. The life goes out of the lighthouse. We're out of service. We're out of luck. This is the middle of the swamp. We have 30 poles, and this is number 15. <laughs> oh, God, what do we do now? So I call the office and say, you know, do you think the construction guys can handle this? No, no way. They build stores, but they don't know how to do this. So I start calling around to these various marine construction agencies, and I start immediately getting bids. Good, here we go. They run between twenty and forty thousand dollars, and nobody's very pleased with that at the main office. There's a place in town called the Island Cafe. It was a wonderful spot it's where all the old timers went. And I met Jed over there. I said, Jed, I got a problem. Then he said, Don't you usually? <laughs> said, yes, yes, sir. You're right. Absolutely. <laughs> What's the problem? And I said, Well, we lost the pole right in the middle of the swamp. It broke at the base. And he said, Yeah, that's a problem. So well, would you come out and look at it? He said, Yeah, I'll come out and look at it. So I boat him out there in my boat, and he looks at it, and he looks at it. And we climb up the tower and look down because you can see the creeks better from up there. And he says things that I don't quite understand. And back down the stairs we go, and he said, Yeah, I can fix it. <clears throat> he went to town, he got a 30 foot pole, and he pre drilled it. And he put it behind the Josie boat, and he dragged it behind the Josie boat to the creek which was closest to the break. Not close, but closest. <clears throat> this creek, as you know from looking at all these swamps, these creeks feed uh, back into Lydian Channel, and there's tide that rushes in there, and that's where all the baby fish go to grow up. That's what we depend on for keeping these redfish and trout alive, for keeping our whole lives happy. And there's this one creek, it's one of the biggest ones, and he says, I think we can get up there. Well, we obviously can't get up there in his boat, so he lashes a rope onto this power pole, and we pull it through the mangrove swamp until we get around the first corner where it's a little deeper. And then we, you won't believe this. I didn't. We got to stride the damn thing and paddled it like a dugout canoe. <laughs> and when we got around the fourth and fifth curve, and these things have, you know, have a lot of curves because of the way the water flows, we reached a spot that was right under the power line and about 250 or 300 feet from the busted pole. And we get these things called peavies. Anybody know what a peavy is? It's a hook on a handle. The handle's about this long, the hook's about this big, and it's articulated like your elbow. So you whack, and then you roll the pole. Wow. And you whack, and you roll, and you whack, and you roll. Oh my God, 200 yards yeah, through yeah. the mud. Oh. And the mangrove, and an occasional oyster, and of course you're slipping and sliding. But at this point, we're covered with mud, and we're laughing. Now, yeah. You figure that one out. On the end of the first day, we got it to the site. And then we walked back through the mud and back through the creek and got on the boat and went home. <clears throat> the next day, fairly early, we reversed the course. We got to the site. There's a stump that's about this tall and it's splintered on top where this pole went down. I and mean, there's not much left, but it's at least it's about this tall. And I said, What the hell are we going to do, Jed? How are we going to raise this thing up? And he said, Well, we got to dig a hole first. So he's got post hole diggers, which we carried up there. We dig a hole with post hole diggers. And we get it deep enough. And then he rigs up the damnedest rig I've ever seen, using that busted pole for a dead man. And in no more than three or four minutes, he's got this big pole rigged. And he pulls on this block and tackle, and uh, comes up, falls in the hole. It's a little crooked, but it falls in the hole. And I don't have the guts to say, Shouldn't we straighten that up? <laughs> <laughs> so we fill in the hole and we jump up and down on it. We get it all done. 
Now the pre-drilling comes in. He looks up and it's, he's lined the holes up just exactly right. This guy's smart. <clears throat> so how, you know, how are we going to get up there? Now here's the situation. The line coming from the pole behind, going to the mast and to the next pole is still intact. And it's got this cross piece which is going up and down in the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, we've turned, we had enough sense to turn the valve off. Oh. <laughs> up and down, it's going up and down. It's about this high off again. Now how the hell are we going to get it up there? And he shinnies up the pole. I mean, shinnies up the pole. This thing is, you know, slimy. And he gets up to the top and he puts his hand over. And then he instructs me to stick the hook in and bring the mast over. He feeds a bolt through it, which he has in his back pocket. Hammers it in with his hand. Spins a nut on the back of it. Comes back down, gets another bolt, goes up, does the same thing. Last trip up, he takes the wrench and he tightens it all up. It looks great. It's almost done. This is the beginning of the cell phone era. And I call the power company and say, okay, you can turn it back on. And what do I get? Between the hours of 8 and 12.30, <laughs> Monday through Wednesday, we will show up. So I say, hey, hey man, they're not going to turn it on. He said, ah, not a problem. Not a problem. So we, we hike back to the swamp, get on his boat head over to where the last power line is on the on the causeway side where the switches are. You know, these are big fuses. And they've been blown out, so you've got to whack them and put them back in there. On the way over, I'm driving, and he's lashing together every piece of junk stick that he's got in the boat. He's got a lot of them. Yeah. And he finally makes this long, it's like 20 foot long thing with a broom on the end of it, and it's real, real loose. <laughs> Get where we're going, run aground, walk up. He walks up, uh, whack, puts one in, walks up, and whack, puts the other in. We look over at the lighthouse two miles away, and the light comes on. $420. <laughs> That's the island. Boy. There's not many of these old guys left. They don't... Sure the people that settled the barrier islands. Yeah. He's one of the people who settled the Barrier Island. He absolutely and totally is. <clears throat> Y'all tired? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got one more if you want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. One more. Yeah. <clears throat> Fog. Oh. Fog is a reality that you have to deal with when you drive a boat. When everything comes by boat, you have to deal with fog. And that's not always easy to do, but it must be done. Fog is romantic. Fog is beautiful. <laughs> fog is cursed. Just depending on where you are at that point. If you're in a boat, uh, you've got a world of trouble. Uh, you can run in fog, and you can run at night, but you can't run at night in fog <laughs> unless you have radar. And we didn't. We had no radar. So we were always cautioning people, be on time, be on time, be on time. Because if it's dark and it's foggy, we're stuck here. We can't get across it. I mean, we might get across, we might kill you on the way, which wouldn't please anybody. <clears throat> so fog just becomes this thing that you deal with. Now, Cameron had to deal with it way more than me because she took a boat to work every day. She is a scientist, a marine scientist, an expert in larval fish. She is the lady who studied what the redfish and trout do around here and why we have them to catch. She would go every day by boat to town. She became locally famous for it. Long red hair blowing in the breeze. You know, skirt. Oh, people would, you know, they say, wow, that's, that's the lighthouse keeper. That's, that's Cameron. They all knew who she was. So she had this system. You go outside onto our porch. You look down the line of power poles, the ones I just described, that I'm now intimately familiar with. <clears throat> four poles, if you can see four poles, it's not a problem. If you can see three poles, think about it. Mm -hmm. If you can only see two poles, it better be an emergency. If you can only see one pole, go back to bed. <laughs> that was her system. On a four-poler, heck, not a problem. And that stuck with us ever since. We'll look outside at our house now where boating doesn't matter and we'll say, <coughs> looks like a two-polar. <laughs> People think we're crazy. Yeah. And maybe we are, yes. 
we had a group to pick up, and uh, you know, it's funny. I hate being late. I just hate it. It's an affliction almost. But most people don't hate it. There's a lot of people who think it's okay, or maybe have no sense of time at all, but they're frequently late. <clears throat> so we'd run over to the docks, and dark is coming down, and you know it's going to fall. You get to where you just know this. You can feel it. You can feel it. The air tells you you're going to get fogged in. We're waiting. They finally show up. They're right on the, right on the edge of town. <clears throat> Five, <coughs> ten more minutes, it'll be too late, and we can't make the run. Get them loaded up, we head out. The fog drops. We're in Lydia Ann Channel. And you run in fog with a stopwatch and a compass. And that's a good way to get there, as long as nothing looms up in front of you, because you can't see that. We're about halfway out Lydia Ann. <clears throat> This lady is sitting on the cushion right in front of the console, and she is tense. And you, know, you can tell. You can tell when people are tense, right? And so her husband is standing next to her, and his arm is beginning to get constricted to the point where he's got no flow to the hand. She's really tense. <laughs> She's uptight. And I can understand it. You know. So I'm trying to pay attention and not get shook and how we're heading. And suddenly I see this loom in the fog. Something that wasn't there when we left. Woo, and it's big, whatever it is. And I wonder, just like this, oh my God, am I in the right channel? Did I make the wrong turn? Am I headed for a Ramses Pass? Am I headed out to sea? Where in the hell am I? <clears throat> and I said, whoa. And she began to pray. <laughs> and instantly the fog lifted. <laughs> We were 200 yards from home in a beautiful sunset. And this thing in front of us was deadly. It was a dredge. And it, you know, it could have taken quite a toll on us. Now, <coughs> that lady was my late mother-in-law. <laughs> you could not tell her that prayer did not work. It just simply wouldn't happen. Got one more. You're always called on to do rescues if you live in a lighthouse. People automatically assume you're the most confident person in the region because you're at the lighthouse and you have to rescue them. And people always are getting in trouble with boats. I do not know why, but I know it happens. And it's usually your fault. It's not their fault. It has to be somebody's fault. Not their fault they ran out of fuel. <clears throat> not their fault the engine quit. It's not their fault that that damn shovel was there and they ran aground. I mean, you know, it's not their fault. So we got used to doing rescues. We did about an average of 10 a year for the almost 20 years we're out there. It's a lot of rescues. You get pretty good at it. Most of them are real simple. You tie a bow in, you pitch it to them, they put it on their front cleat, and you tow them in. It takes some time, but you can do it. And then you learn how, how to dock them when you get there, and you get pretty fancy with it after a while. You get to where you can take a big boat on the hip and drag it in, and put them to bed and then leave and you know it's it's nice to feel that compliment <clears throat> but some people just are not ever grateful I mean it's amazing but they're not so two come to mind two incidents come to mind I told you how many times now that I hate to be late I hate to be late I've got to deliver a talk in town and guess who I'm delivering it to the garden club. <laughs> We've already lost our credibility, and I've got to go in and reestablish it. I do not want to be late. But when you see someone who needs rescue, you have to rescue them. There is no other way. So I'm heading into town, and there's a well-known show, well-known to me, off on the port side, and just before I hit the ship channel, I see this guy, and he's going like this. And that is a recognized international distress signal. I think, I'll just pretend I don't see it. <laughs> I'm damn well going to be late if I don't go. But I, I can't. So uh, I pull over and I come up and see what seems to be the trouble. He said, well, I'm a ground. I said, yeah, I guess so. What's your draft? He doesn't know. It's a keel boat, that's for sure. But he has no idea how deep the draft is. So okay, I'm not dealing with an expert here. So here. Uh, get everything in out of the water, and I'll throw you a line, 
And I use a nylon line. And so you put this around your bow cleat, and then you kind of sit in the middle of the boat, and I'll go way out, and this thing stretches like a rubber band. This is fun. I mean, it really is. It's amazing. It stretches and stretches, and you hear it. You hear it. It sings to you. So you stretch, stretch, and then you stop. And you hold the boat with the throttle. And little by little, the stretch comes out and it pulls this boat off of the shoal, and everything's fine. It works every time. And it's easier on the boat because it's slow instead of boom. <clears throat> so I work my way in on him, I pitch him a line, he puts it on there, and I said, Now get everything in the water and I'll pull you off. He said, No, no, no. I've got to lower the sails first. I said, Oh my God. I'm really going to be late. So he, he's a real fussy guy, and he lowers the sails and he ties them all up just right. And, I'm like, oh. and then he calls up all the lines and he puts them below. And then he shuts all the hatches and then he comes back and sits down. I said, Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, take out the slack, uh, hold it against there. He starts to move. His nose comes around to face me, which you always expect, and he stops. And he stops. So I get a little more throttle. I just want to go anywhere. I get a little more throttle. And I pull him about another six inches. I said, something wrong here. And I come off the throttle. Now I've got to work my way back in on him. Those of you who operate boats know that lines in the water and boat propellers do not mix well. So you've got to work your way back in by coiling the line as you go, or you're going to be stopped too. So I get up close enough to Haley and then I say, what do you think the problem is? And he said, you're not using enough power. I said, well, <clears throat> you know, I really think I am. He said, well, maybe you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got a knife in my pocket. <laughs> and it crosses my mind. <clears throat> maybe <clears throat> the best thing I can do with this guy is cut the line. <laughs> and cut my losses. And I said, oh, what the heck. And I try again. No repeat. And maybe move him a couple of feet. That's it. I come back in, I'm about to tell him, I'm sorry, I can't do this. And I look off the stern of his boat, there is a line. Yeah. And it is tight. Yeah. And there is an anchor. On the <laughs> I said, what the, is that? He said, that's my anchor. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. What, why did you throw the anchor out? He said, because I wanted to keep the boat straight so you wouldn't pull me over on my side. I said, well, I don't need to <coughs> discuss this any further. Wade back and get that anchor. It's set pretty hard now. You're going to have to wade back together or cut the line and leave it there. Those are your choices. i got to go. <clears throat> and he says, no, I'm not dressed for getting wet. <laughs> I said, you know, somebody invented this guy. I mean, these are my friends. They've set me up. That's just, this is too perfect. It's the garden lover. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I finally said, okay, then leave your anchor here or leave yourself here. So he, I get him to tie a uh, uh, life jacket on the anchor and throw ankle line, throw it overboard. Pull him off, no problem at all. Come up, get him on the hip, coil up the line. He starts his engine and leaves, and he never said thank you. Oh, 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 man. Nice guy. <laughs> the back of this boat said Rockport. <laughs> yes, 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 it did. One other. It's evening time. It's time for a drink. We're sitting on the porch at the lighthouse watching this beautiful, gorgeous scene in front of us, and a big sailboat comes up. It's a big one. It's like 36, 38 feet, and it's way too close to shore. And we know what's under the water. You know, the trouble is the water all looks the same on the top, but it's all different on the bottom. So we say, ooh, this is not, not going to work, and shoop. He stops, and he's not you know, 20 yards off the lighthouse shore. Uh, it's a bad shore. There's a big ass shore. And it's, a, it's shaped like this, and it's a trap. <coughs> then a guy hops over the side, and he's in boating clothes, and he walks through the mangrove swamp, and I don't know what that's like. And he gets up to us, hat in hand, and says, Yeah, we can help you. We can help you. I can't possibly get you off of there, but I can take your people into town. So. We get in the boat, we go up. Now, a norther is beginning to blow. Does it sound like a soap opera? 
The snorter is starting to blow up, and the waves are beginning to mount the side of his boat, which is now healing, listing, because it's shallow. And so I horse the boat up. That means you park it against the other boat and keep it there with power, and you steer it back and forth, keep it straight. So you bring your people and unload them. So they've got to cross his, his uh, handrail and then my handrail, and then they'll be on the boat. <clears throat> so I tell them now, one boat on his, one hand on his rail, one hand on mine, and then step inside. Well, the first one across is a kid. He leaps in like a monkey. He's having a great time. It's a, it's a wonderful adventure. The next person across is a young lady, and she has a little more trouble, but not too bad. She's obviously done boating before. And then comes a, a rather elderly man, probably about 20 years younger than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's pretty old. <clears throat> he has a little more difficulty, but not too bad. He gets over and he gets in. Then, the pièce de résistance. A lady with a big pocketbook <laughs> shows up, and she's she's his age, so you know I've already told you I think they're old, and she's got a skirt and low pump heels and not bow clothes at all, <clears throat> and this huge pocketbook. And so hand me your purse first, and then let yourself in, you know, because you want to use both hands. No, she's not going to do it. I'll let go of that pocketbook. So finally we get her in. It's not easy, but we get her in. Now the waves are beginning to come over the back of my boat and washing out the scupper. But we've got to get out of here. So <clears throat> get back out, turn around, head into town, offload them at the dock, and she never once let go of that person. And I always wonder what was in that. <laughs> I always wonder what was in that. Well, I went back out, and it's a terrible night, and I go over to the boat and one more time. I work my way on it, knock on the door, he comes, knock on the hole. He comes out and I said, look, we'll take you in. You can, you can stay with us and you can have a good supper and a glass of wine. He said, no, I'm going to stay with the boat. I said, okay, that's what a captain's supposed to do. Well, I go back in, we go to sleep. Next morning, I call a rescue team. They come in and for a huge sum of money, blow him off that shoal and take him into town. And it's all forgotten. 17 years later, we are at a soiree in Corpus Christi. They do things big over there, you know, young ones. So we're at this real fancy show in Corpus Christi, and a guy comes walking up to me, I don't you know who he is. He said, you're with the lighthouse keeper. I said, yes, yes, as a matter of fact, that's right. He said, you saved my life. And I'm thinking, I don't remember saving anybody's life. You know, we maybe saved embarrassment, we can help them out, but I don't remember saving anybody's life. I said, really? Really? He said, yes. Do you remember the big sailboat that ran around in front of the lighthouse? I said, oh, yes. I remember it very well. He said, do you remember the lady with the big pipe book? I said, yeah. I do. I can never forget that. He said, that was my brand new mother-in-law. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> answer it uh, with any degree of accuracy. I do not know. I do know that there could never be a better steward for something like the lighthouse, which is unforgiving and incredibly expensive, than Charles Butt. You could not design a better steward. What will happen to it? I don't know. He has not shared that with me. But I have this feeling that having survived since 1854, it will still survive. Will it become public property? In some ways, I hope not. We have all seen what the state can do with historic structures. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. The cost of keeping that place up is immense. We've all seen what the federal people can do, given the same chore. There's, you know, not very far away, there's a national park. <clears throat> it could go to one of those agencies. If it goes to a nonprofit, then they better be real good at fundraising. So I don't know what will happen, but I suspect 
if any of you are sitting on a very large checkbook <laughs> and you would like to own a lighthouse, that would be the time to make your offer. It's a story. Yeah, it's a story. Again, There's a Harvey really hammered it. Rick, you got a question? Yes, sir. Rick, did you and Cameron do the majority of the hard labor, or did you hire contractors? <laughs> I wish I had hired contractors. Uh, when, I, when we went out there, we were quite young and did all the work, almost all the work, myself. When there was some huge job, we would bring in some contractors. The hardest part was finding a contractor who was willing to put all this stuff on the boat and get out there. But yeah, the majority of the work we did. Now, when repointing the tower, which got done, no, we did not do that. Uh, you know, and putting new putting new fence around the top, we could do that, things of that nature. Rewiring the structures, that wasn't a problem. Bringing new power across, no, so it's a mix.